Welcome to the Murrily End. My name is Mark Machado. I am joined by Estelle Vazu Devon. We're going to talk all things about the Shrunken Women's side who are doing much better than their male counterparts. Before we get to that, though, if you have just found us, if you're listening in your podcast app, then hit the, the follow or subscribe button. If you're watching on YouTube, hit that follow or subscribe button. That's down there somewhere. Leave us a comment as well and a like. Um, and if you haven't done so already, subscribe to our newsletter. When we're not mildly depressed from the exploits of the T20 World Cup that do not go our way, we put out a newsletter once a week. Um, when we're depressed, it might be a little bit longer. Um, but we do do regular content all about the Shrunken cricket team, everything that's going on in Shrunken. We've got lots coming up. We've got the Women's Asia Cup. We've got a Women's World Cup to look forward to. We've got the LPL. Um, we've got um, a tour of India as well coming up our annual tour of india thank you jay shah um to to look forward to and of course we've got the test series in england that i'm very excited about because i'll be going to some of that as well but today estelle we are talking about the women's side let's um start off by talking about that what ended up being quite an emphatic odi series win against the west indies these girls are in a roll now aren't they yeah i I don't know how many people saw that coming, right? We did a preview show with Santoki from Caribbean Cricket uh, Podcast. And, you know, we thought it'd be a really close series where probably 2-1 would be the result to either team. But like you mentioned, like comprehensive wins in all three games, it didn't look like uh, West Indies were in any position to win any of those three games, I would think. And what was kind of billed as Matthews versus Atapattu, it didn't really turn out that way at all, right? Atapattu had a couple of good knocks, but at the end of the day, it was, I would say, complete all-round performance from Sri Lanka. They just blew the West Indies away in that in all three games. So Estelle, um, I, I think pretty much the first time me and you ever talked to each other on at least Zoom or any sort of uh, podcast format, was about where the Shrunker women's team have gone. That feels like it was only about two minutes ago, um, <laughs> but in reality, I think it was. I think it was actually about two and a half, maybe three years yeah. ago. And in that time period, the Shrunker team have kind of reemerged. They've gone to Commonwealth Games uh, where they didn't do much. Charmery, who we you know pre-COVID was a talismanic player, has kind of led from the front. And we've, we've seen a team slowly start to assemble around her. But I really feel this series, the you know, beyond the result, the big landmark for me was is that we were winning without huge input from Charmory. She's still, you know, she's still putting a lot. Um, and also, the, the second big thing about it was is that we're starting to rotate a team and we're seeing what's gone from what feels like from kind of one player, from kind of two or three players around her to an 11, to now, there's about 15 or 16 girls fighting for those 11 places. And on top of all that, it looks like we might even be able to change our team tactically with regards to pitches and, and you know, lineups of opposition lineups as well. It's all kind of coming together, isn't it? Yeah, it's been incredible, right? I just, I can't help but think, like, I think it was exactly two years ago when Sri Lanka played India. Um, and I was lucky enough to be in the commentary panel for those games, I mean, in, during the ODIs and the T20s, I remember before the series started, uh, I did a Twitter space with um, a couple of Indian journalists, right? And, you know, at the end, the host asked me, okay, make your prediction, is Sri Lanka making, making it to the 50 over World Cup automatically or will they have to go go through qualifiers, right? Because they didn't play the 2022 World Cup. They didn't qualify. That was, I mean, partly their fault, but also partly due to the fact that COVID was around and the qualifiers didn't take place properly. Anyway, at that point, and I'll admit at that point, I said, yes, Sri Lanka is going to go through. And that was purely like I was bullshitting, right? Because I did not believe that they would be able to qualify automatically. My, my optimism had finally rubbed off on you. <laughs> <laughs> like... <laughs> I don't, I don't, I wonder if we knew each other at that point. Um, I said, yes, Sri Lanka will qualify. I have to say that Sri Lanka will qualify, but I didn't really believe it because you have to remember only five automatic spots available if you take out India, right? With India, it's six, the host six. So five spots available. You know Australia is going through. And Sri Lanka had never beaten New Zealand, beaten England once. 
uh, had been struggling against South Africa, had been struggling against Pakistan. I've seen Sri Lanka get whitewashed by Pakistan, right? Um, so it was not going to be easy. And even the West Indies, right? This this series win was the first one since 2008 or nine. So at that point, I was like, there's in my mind, there's no way we qualify automatically. We're going to have to play the qualifiers. But Sri Lanka fifth in that table after missing out on international cricket for two years. It's been an incredible turnaround. I don't think a lot of people realize how incredible because there, there aren't that many eyeballs on Sri Lanka, right? As as an international team, it's just that now as they kind of roll on, people are watching them, but they don't get the attention that an Australia, England or India get. Uh, part of that is, you know, the media in Sri Lanka doesn't really show much interest towards the team when they're not winning. At the moment, there's a lot of attention on them. But um, it's been kind of, and it's it's come so quickly that it's really difficult to explain how things have gone. Because like we, like we discussed before, it's no long, I mean, you can't really say it's a one one woman team anymore, right? I'm just looking at, I was just looking over the scorecards um, before we recorded this, right? In the three games, we've had performances from Vishmi, Chamari, Nilakshi, Anushka Sanjeevani, uh, Sachini Nisansala, Achini Kulasurya, Kavisha, Sugantika Kumari, Harshita Samaravikrama and Hasini Pereira. All of them have performed at some point in, in the three games, right? And I don't think we've ever seen something like that. We've always seen... Um, in games where, you know, Atapattu gets a hundred, somebody supports her. Uh, we've seen games won like that. But this series as a whole has been a complete all-round performance. And it's so good to see because we're coming towards a very, very important period in um, in the in the women's cricket timeline, right? With with the T20 World Cup this year and, it, and an ODI World Cup next year. So it's going to be really crucial uh, how they perform and how they're able to kind of make their presence felt in the Sri Lankan cricket environment as well, particularly with the men's team, you know, not doing so well. Um, you, you talk there about how, um, A, the men's team is doing well, and B, how there's a, a growing interest in Sri Lanka for the women's team. What Can you can you expand on that a little bit more? Obviously, I, I'm in exile in London, so <laughs> I'm not on the <laughs> on the... On the factory floor as it were i mean when you're out and about are you hearing people talk about the the sri lanka women's side there's a lot of interest particularly on social media but i will say i'm very i'm a bit on the fence on whether it's good or not because i just feel like a lot of it is to do with comparing them to the men's team and you know saying stuff like there's no point supporting the men's team let's support the women's team which I don't think does anybody any good, right? You're just bringing unnecessary negativity to a women's team, which hasn't like done anything to deserve that. Because eventually they're going to lose. I mean, that's part of the game, right? They're going to have their, uh, they're going to have bad tournaments. They're going to have series where they don't perform as well as they have done, and then you're going to see all that turn back again. So, I'm not. Uh, 100% sold on the attention they're getting, whether it's actually positive, but at least it is reaching more people because you see it in news bulletins now, you see it on social media, you see people like, uh, I mean, obviously you guys know I've I've been, I was working at the papare.com and we have a, uh, we still have like a, a cricket group, right? Where all the people who covered cricket and, you know, others are involved. And now since most of them, most of us are not, not at Papare, we still kind of talk about cricket. And there's so much conversation about the women's game. And it doesn't like, it's it doesn't start with the women have played well. It's like Sri Lanka have done really well against West Indies, right? If we win these games, we can go through to the World Cup automatically. And everybody knows which team they're talking about which is not the case, like, which has not been the case in the past where, you know, if you, if someone had said, uh, if you win the next series, we're in the World Cup, somebody is inevit inevitably going to be asking, like, what World Cup, right? But people are, like, real fans are, it's reaching a lot more people. And I, I have to say, 
a lot of that is to do with the fact that it's on TV and it's available for people to view, right? I think you and I have discussed so many times about how, what it was like early in in the early days, right? Like even when I was growing up, there was no women's cricket on TV. I think I started following the team probably 2015 properly. That's just because I got into this industry, right? Other than that, it wasn't really on TV. And now I think one huge positive, unfortunately, it also means that I don't get commentary gigs, but one big positive is that it's on free to air TV in Sri Lanka, which is available all around the island. I'm sure that will have a massive impact on how far reaching like their performances are. And like, it's, it's so, it's so great that they are, their big performances are coming when they've been on TV and when people can see how good they are. Um, can we talk about one of my favourite players and someone I have championed since I heard about exploits as like a 12-year-old or something, <laughs> scoring scoring about 800 runs in the T20, and that's Vishmi. Um, it, I feel like I've been talking about her for about half a decade. Uh, that's not true because she's only 18. But it's taken her a while to kind of find consistent international form. But I kind of feel touch wood that she might be in that place now. Definitely in ODIs. Yeah, Vishmi is an interesting one because personally, I felt like they rushed her into the team way too early. She had like, obviously, she scored like 400 runs in a 30 over game <laughs> in school's cricket. Um, and then she got played club cricket and she got 100 against Atapattu's team, Chilaumerians, and then was kind of fast tracked into the national side. I felt it was too soon and that she'd been, you know, she's been thrown to the wolves kind of. Uh, and she has had her troubles, I feel, um, in the last year and a half or two years that she's played cricket. But it just feels in the last couple of months that things are slightly coming together. I mean, earlier you would see her playing a lot of dot balls early on, you know, trying to get settled in and then you'd see the odd four, you know, odd run. And it seemed like she didn't have any options to at least rotate the strike. But over the last couple of series, it seemed like she's, you know, really grown. That's the interesting thing, I think, Mark, about the women's team is that I feel like it's all it's almost been a blessing that that ha there hasn't been depth because it's meant that the same players have got like an extended period of time to kind of get into international cricket and like without worrying about like being left out because there aren't other options, right? If, if you look if you look at the team, like Hasini Pereira, Anushka Sanjeevani, Harshita, uh, Kavisha, Nilakshi De Silva, uh, Vishmi Gunaratna, are the six who are batting alongside Chamal, right? N none of them have, I mean, barring Harshita, I think, none of the others, the other five, really, if you look at their records, they don't have great records, right? That's because like the first four or five years of their careers, they haven't played well, but they were never kind of, I mean, even if they were dropped, it hasn't been for an extended period of time because there is no depth. But that also means that now they're slowly growing into the international game and are now putting up like good performances. Hasini Pereira is one of, I think, the, the better players to watch uh, when yeah. she's batting. She's so good on the offside. But she, I mean, she's, she was terrible like three years ago. She would struggle to get going. But slowly we are seeing them build into better players. So um, Vishmi is definitely on that role. Like I'm just looking at her scores over the last 10 games, right? She has two 50s um, and three more scores above 40. Of course, I will say some of those games were in the qualifiers. So against associate countries. But that's still, I think, really promising for a player who's batting. Like, it can't be easy coming in to bat alongside Atapattu, right? There's the temptation to try and stay with her, you know, the pressure of getting her on strike sometimes. It comes with different kinds of pressure than it might if you are the leading batter, right? So it's been really and, and, and good also, to see. And also, yeah. I just, you know, you said some of that's against associate nations, but actually, I mean, I feel... And obviously, I haven't researched associate women's cricket in every nation they've played against. But I feel some of the teams they're playing against are coming from 
pl- uh, countries where the structure for women's cricket is probably more well developed than it is in Sri Lanka, right? Because there isn't a huge amount of structure in Sri Lanka at the moment with women's cricket, you know, beyond you know, outside of what's organised by SLC. You know, I know there is domestic tournaments, but they're not they're not massive. They're not paying yeah. any. I, I I I'd be surprised if they're getting paid. Uh, to play domestically our girls apart from Charmery, i don't think any of them have played any franchise cricket as well right so they've got the same kind you know the, the, you go and play thailand and actually in terms of what the thai cricket board is providing those mm. their girls compared to our girls it's not that dissimilar though i do know i you know i, I will acknowledge that in recent months our um our team are getting paid a lot more than they used to get yeah. paid right so sorry go back to your uh I, yeah, I, I was just like I was I was just going to like end it with like it's good to see her performing well because it's you always know I and I think this is across the board it's true right you know there's talent there's always talent in Sri Lanka it's about everything else that has to fall into place um and it seems like it's finally clicking for her Another area where we are developing stocks is in fast bowling as well right um We've seen the emergence of a couple new fast bowlers coming through. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, just on the quicks, I think they don't get a lot of attention because Sri Lanka is such a a spin-heavy bowling lineup, right? And I I thought it was really interesting over the last year or so how we have pivoted from playing just a single fast bowler. I mean, when I say fast, I just, I mean medium pace, okay? Seema, Uh, Seema. (laughs) <laughs> Udeshika Prabodhini has been around for a long, long time, right? And she's had a couple of performances, notably, I think, against Australia in the 2020 World Cup, where she got a couple of early wickets and really put Australia on the ropes. Um, she's had, she like, she's been consistently good, right? She's been that Chamindavas type figure for Sri Lanka. But Sri Lanka always, I think for, for a long time, they played only one pacer because they just felt like their strength was always in the spin bowling department. So they just packed them up um, and, you know, go with that singular pacer. But now with Achini Kulasurya coming in, has a bit of a slingy action, can get the ball to move around. And I think this series, she's been bowling spells of like five, six overs on the trot, right? She didn't play the sec- third ODI. I think second one, she bowled seven overs for like 15 runs and picked up two wickets. She's been incredibly good. And if I'm not mistaken, during the last Asia Cup, the semi-final against Pakistan, she's the one who bowled that tight last over where Sri Lanka defending like nine or 10 runs, right? So it's good to see two fast bowlers coming in, bowling in tandem, you know, not giving too much away. And Sri Lanka having that, like you spoke about that versatility, like we do have options now. And another one who who played the last game was Kavya Kavindi. Very, very young. Uh, let me just check how, sh- how old she is. Another one who can move the ball. And I think that's very, it's an important trait to have, particularly at the pace they bowl. So we don't have a lot of cricketers, bo- like uh, women's cricketers bowling at 110, 120, right? So to have that element in their game is really important she's she's 21 by the way so another young player um so those three i thought in this series were super impressive hopefully there is a there's a kind of a line coming through as well because i don't know for how many more years udeshika prabodhini is going to be playing i thought she retired in 2020 but she didn't obviously (laughs) uh but uh yeah it's it's it's, I, I just wanted to like emphasize the fact that we don't talk about them much because always the, the spotlight is always on the spinners, right? But these bowlers are giving that start that Sri Lanka need right now. Um, a few months ago, after the, was it the South Africa series, there was some suggestions that Charmory might retire mm. sooner than we all hope. Um, she's been the leader for a long, long time. Uh, she's had to kind of carry the bat and often the ball as well for a long, long time. She's seen a group come through now underneath her who are, you know, sh- sharing the the load of of getting the runs and and getting wickets as well. 
What do you think she's thinking about her, you know, continuing as captain and also these youngsters coming through and picking up all the uh, player of the series, player of the match awards in terms of, you know, and, and she did post about this the other day, you know, she, 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 she was talking about how proud she was of it. But what do you think would be in her thoughts now, kind of what, three months out from a World Cup, potentially that she was, it felt like she was teeing us up for this could be her last major ICC throw of the dice. Um, but she looks at this team and she must be thinking, I want to stick about with it for a few more years because yeah. this could be something, Estelle. Yeah, that's really interesting. I think because she's been, I mean, apart from early in her career, like 2013, where Sri Lanka were kind of coming up. And like, if I compare the two eras, right? At that point, we were always like the underdog winning you know, that one-off game. But now things are very different, right? Like we've been, it's not been those one-off games. We've won series against New Zealand, South Africa, England, right? And now the West Indies. So actually, that's a good one. Like, does she think like, this is my chance to finally be in like a really competitive team, a team that could like genuinely be a contender to be like, in the semifinals of these next two tournaments, right? Because if you look at world cricket right now, I think it's very difficult to, it's difficult to look past Australia and India at this point as like, you know, the real powerhouses in the game. England are not far behind. I know they lost to Sri Lanka in uh, England, but I think if you look at it overall and over a longer period of time, they've been consistently good against those two top teams. Um, so it's difficult to look past those three teams as, you know, quite dominant in, in this era. But I don't know who is who is fourth best team right now in the women's game. You could probably, it, it would... Ha- well, the rankings um, reckon South Africa, right? I mean, yeah. who we've just beaten. So Yeah, so South Africa would be, I was going to say like, South Africa would be most people's number four. But I think it's a lot closer than it was pre-COVID. Like, um it's no like you could you could you would probably pick south africa still but when when sri lanka come up against them the game could go either way and no one would be surprised right if they if it did like we saw that in the t20 world cup opener it wasn't a surprise by any stretch of the imagination that sri lanka were able to overcome them um so that's where like the women's like the environment stands right now. So I, like I mentioned before, like two years ago, that was not the case, like two years ago, not too long ago. Uh, the real question from a Sri Lankan cricket perspective and from a end perspective is, how far are we away from the emergency, emergence of agenda aunties who call <laughs> for Charmory to be out of the team? That is the real question. And I think, I, you know, I think that's right. why she she wants to retire before her agenda aunties come and tell her <laughs> she's too fat, she's got a big belly, or you know she only she scores for the team. She's selfish. She keeps she doesn't give the strike to other players. You know, dot ball merchant like, can't run two one kilometers. O- one over specialist. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, um, shall we look ahead to the T uh, Twenty series that's about to start? The squad came out. Um, hours before we recorded, uh, we would have recorded a bit earlier, but I was out at a uh, restaurant eating biryani, so I had to hot fit at home. <laughs> um, and then there was a whole tra- dra- uh, drama with the camera that you need not know about. Um, if you've made it this far, you've got to hit the subscribe button as well. So subscribe if you watch on YouTube, leave us a comment, leave us a like, tell your friends into Shrug and Cricket about all of us. Tell your friends who aren't into Shrug and Cricket about us as well. Um, Estelle, the T20 series starts against the West Indies. My time in about 12 hours, as you know, if you follow this podcast closely, I have absolutely no idea of what how time zones work. So <laughs> I assume it's 12 hours everywhere else in the world at the point that I'm recording this. Um, there's been a few changes to the squad, some of which we weren't expecting, right? Yeah, some big surprises in the squad. Uh, Anushka Sanjeevani, uh, Achini Kulasurya, who I spoke about, Deshika Prabodhini, not in the team. Very, very surprising. And a lot of people were talking about it. But I have good news. They've not been dropped. They've been rested for this series, according to someone within uh, Sri Lanka cricket. Uh, 
because the Asia Cup and the World Cup is coming up, um, they want to give them a bit of the rest. Do you, bit do of you a rest. think that's the? Do you think that's the right thing to do? Right? Or do you not think it's playing an, cricket is the right it's, way? It's an interesting one, right? Because women, the women's team doesn't play a lot of cricket. I mean, if you look at their schedules, they're not as packed as the men's side of things, right? But I just feel like, okay, July is going to be the Asia Cup. Um, and then I think we have a, we're going to Ireland in, in between the World Cup and the Asia Cup. Um, so it should be a packed couple of months for them. I don't like, like I said, like the fast bowlers bowl a lot of long spells during the ODIs. I feel like it's fair to give them a rest. Um, and obviously it's not like their, their positions are in doubt, right? you know, they're going to slot back in straight away for the Asia Cup. Uh, the interesting one is actually Anushka Sanjeevani, who just played, I think, the best knock of her career in that third T20, sorry, T third ODI, um, being kept out of the side when there's no real, like, backup who they've, who they've been kind of ha keeping as her understudy, right? Um, but like I said, I spoke to someone within Sri Lanka cricket, they are thinking, and Mark, you can you can tell me what you think about it. Is that since she's playing well, they want to give her a rest now rather than give her a rest when she's out of form, so that now her she's she's mentally relaxed. She knows she's not dropped, or there's no other like agenda to keep her out. Like they want to bring try someone else or whatever. She's genuinely just being given a rest so that she'll be fit and ready to go. Uh, come the Asia Cup and they have someone called Kaushini Nutyangani in the squad a, uh, another young batter wicket keeper who will come in and play all three games so that they have that backup option in the next three months which are, which are going to be like I said you know heavy on the schedule right uh, Prasadini Virakkodi is the backup keeper for the ODIs but looking at her style of play and, you know, she, she's not the youngest play, player going around as well. They've decided that it would be better to invest their time and energy on this youngster so that, you know, she gets, she's sure of getting three games, you know, find her feet in international cricket a little bit and then, you know, see how things go in case they need that additional wicket keeper to come into the team. Then they have you know, they've seen the option that they have and, you know, she's also had a bit of a taste of international cricket. So I've got two conflicting views about this. Mm. My first view is, is that I'm happy that we are confident enough with our squad that we feel like we can change things around like that and blood new players because in the long term, we'll definitely need a bigger squad and we should give people opportunities because you don't want to get, you know, Injuries can pop up at any moment, right? Yeah. That's the nature of, of the game that we love and watch and play. Um, my second thought on this, though, is when a player's in form, we want to keep them playing. If you look at the men's team and you look at you know the New Zealand men's side, both of those teams coming into the World Cup that they both had premature exits off. And, and I suppose you could argue Pakistan's side, though, even though they, they had a series against Ireland, is that the big thing for both New Zealand and Sri Lanka is mm. I thought both their, their those sets of teams, those squads hadn't played a lot of cricket going into into the into the World Cup. Obviously, that is a different gender. Could argue, you know, that the the sports kind, you know, that they're, they're the same sport but also different sports, right? Um, so maybe it doesn't matter as much. Maybe they feel that they'll have if if she's in form. I I would have thought she would have wanted to play. Right, because as you say, there isn't a huge amount of opportunity to play international cricket, uh, regardless of your gender for who you know, whichever team you play for. So I'm kind of I'm kind of surprised on yeah. the decision, but also I can see from a kind of wider team perspective why that would have been taken. I just think you want your best players playing as much cricket as possible, and that's what you would try and do. But I think you can make ar arguments either way. I think, though, from what we understand of the justification for the call, it feels to me like it's a like it's out of confidence 
around mm. the player and around yeah. the squad, and it's trying to build more confidence in the squad. Also, and it's like that... it's it's possible that you know, if if she plays these C twenties and gets like a run of three like bad scores, right, low scores, that maybe then her co- confidence goes down again. Um, so you kind of leave her out on a high, but I I I think I am on your side on this that it, it feels a bit strange to be leaving out a player when they've just played you know the best knock in their international career right you would think that that player would want to keep going and make the most out of it because i mean i know pe- like people talk about records like they don't care about records but anushka sanjeevan is recording t20s is 72 games 642 runs average of 13 and a strike rate of 87. So, I mean, in three tw- T20s, if she can, if she can get like two innings where she's scoring at like 120, that would definitely give her a lot more confidence, right? But I mean, like I said before, I think all three of the players who they've rested are definite starters for Sri Lanka. So it's also, I guess, you know, giving them the confidence that, you know, take a break. You're coming straight back into the team, so you know take a break from the game and come, come, come ahead, come to the Asia Cup refreshed. Can, can I caveat it with two, like two further points? I think mm. firstly, and almost most importantly, Sri Lanka cricket and around the women's team as well. I, I should caveat this with, and the management around the women's team has barely put a foot wrong in the last mm. eighteen months or so, right? If they think this is the right decision to make, then they have a lot more data. They know how these players' minds work and what they need. I've never met any of the people involved in making this decision or the person who who's at the core of this decision either. So, you know, I could be totally wrong. And I think that they've earned enough to, you know, they've done enough to earn our trust in the decisions. And secondly... I just want to say, Estelle, I'm absolutely overjoyed that we've even got to a situation where we can talk about selection issues mm. around the women's side, right? Because it wasn't that long ago where me and you were going, we don't even know who the manager of this team is. We don't yeah. know who the head coach is. And are they going to play again? And now we've come so far. And I know I said this right at the beginning of the show, but I think it's worth saying again, we've come so far in such a short space of time with, with women's cricket in Sri Lanka that we're having selection decisions, that they're looking to blood new players, that they're trying to try new things out. And I think that speaks so well for the health of the game. But that said, I still think there's a lot, lot more they can do. Mm. Um, and yeah. there's, a, there's a lot more they can, they, they can be doing and, and could be done imminently. Sorry. Yeah. I, one thing I, I would like just occurred to me while you were talking is also the fact that you know we, we spoke you spoke about the the decisions being taken around the team i just think also like to compare it with the men's team it's probably a lot less cluttered right so yeah. there is clarity of thought in that you can trust the coach and the decisions he makes because there aren't ten thousand voices telling you you know 500 past cricketers on different tv shows you know nitpicking whatever went wrong and there isn't that like it's a good thing that you have attention but sometimes in situations like this it also brings a lot of clarity right because they can make their decisions and because there aren't too many people trying to poke their fingers in they can kind of do what they need to do and go forward that way which which I think has been a, a feature of their success over the past couple of years, right? The fact that there is that clarity of thought on what the roles are and what each person needs to do, but also there isn't that amount of, you know, outside chat that is reaching them as well. Yeah, absolutely. And I wonder if, you know, me and you even adding to that outside chat is, <laughs> is good or bad. But that's what we're here to do in the early end, right? Like mm-hmm. discuss these these uh, selection dilemmas um, and decisions and, and kind of hold people to account. But yeah, I think it's interesting, right? Because I've, I've seen people talk about whether the team behind the women's side, the management team, should actually be transplanted to the men's team. But that would be the major difference, right? Um, they just there's so much more interference with with other yeah. people, and also right. like you know there like 
it's so different, right? How things are run. Like, it's like trying, expecting something that works in the UK to suddenly work in Sri Lanka. It's very, very different. The environments are very different. And I think, like, you know, I, I think I should mention this because there was so much commentary on, you know, Chamari's leadership and stuff after the series win, right? And and so much comparison with the men's team and all of that. Chamari Atapattu has been in this job for six, seven years now. She's matured as a person, matured as a cricketer. She's, you know, been exposed to so many things, right? And that, that has been how she's grown to where she is now. Um, like I mentioned to you before we started recording, like I've been, I've been, re I've reported on a game where uh, very early in her captaincy, where, you know, Shashikala Sirivadana had to basically take over what was going on in the field because Atapattu was so mad about things going badly that she just blew up and she went to the boundary, right? And like, this is not criticism of her, but that's where things like things start from somewhere. Right. And I, and I want to come back to a point that Marvan Atapattu made on one of the TV shows that um, he's been doing for the T20 World Cup. And he spoke about how, if you look at the men's team, there's always been, uh, I, I mean, look at the successful years when, when Sri Lanka was playing well on the men's side, right? There's always been a player that they're grooming to be captain. So when when Arjuna was captain, you had like Sanat Roshan Mahanama being groomed to be the next captain, right? When Sanat was captain, you had Mahela Sangakkara being groomed. Then when they were captains, you had like Angelo Matthews being groomed to be captain. But if you look at the, how things are right now, that's not the case, right? Your two matches into a World Cup, you switch captaincy. <laughs> and then you hand a guy captaincy just before T20 World Cup. It's 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 not easy to adapt to a situation like that, right? And And what he said was basically during this grooming period, you're given training and you're given media training and how to speak to people and how to react because you're like journalists, most journalists are trying to get a quote out of you, right? Let's admit it. That's, 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 yeah. they're trying to sell something, right? And the best way they can sell it is if you may say something outrageous. So that, that, that grooming period is not there right now. And that's why you're seeing so many, like, so much of criticism of players, how they talk, the media, all of that. If you look at the women's side, Shashikala being captain, Atapattu was being groomed to be captain after her. And now Harshita Samaravikram is being groomed to be captain. Like you, you, you can see that mantle being passed on to someone like Harshita, Kavisha, Dilhari. They are being given that, right? So that, that, that leadership, those qualities don't come overnight i know i've gone completely off topic but i thought like it's important to say I don't, no right? i don't th i don't think that's off topic at all um because i, th I think it all fits into mm. kind of you know p people are looking at this you know this is a show about Sri Lankan women yeah the, the Sri Lankan women's team but people are looking at it because it is a successful side and they're asking themselves the question why is our women's team successful and, mm. our, and our men's team a total mess at the moment and it's because all the fundamentals that were in place when Sri Lanka was successful in a men's side have kind of in place of the women's side but yeah we've lost those fundamentals of the men's team right and I know you shouldn't compare the two but I think there's there's massive lessons to be learned and I, th I think the lessons the, pe the people the people need to Mark, learn the lessons are at SLC right <laughs> like like doesn't isn't it also the fact that like the women's game or well, the Sri Lankan women's team I know there's a lot there's been a lot of investment right but nobody can convince me that SLC cares as much about the women's team as they do the men's team right so when there is that lit that there is no not as much interference in there then things can move smoothly right yeah Today, Vanindu Hasaranga gets criticized and there are rumors that he might step down from captaincy. Um, that's not how things should work, right? Like, you can't have that happening. And like I mentioned before, giving a guy who's your best batter captaincy in the middle of a World Cup 
ab- like how can you you can't justify these decisions right like that and a lot of that is because there's that outside thing Le- the fewer people who care about the women's game the easier it is to run at the moment right so should we talk about the uh t20 series this is us now on the kind of run up into into the world cup right this is we've got this we've got an asia cup then we've got a series against ireland and then we're there right that's roughly the timeline yeah i'm i'm not entirely sure about the ireland series because i don't think it's been confirmed yet uh but minimum it would be West Indies, three T20s, then the Asia Cup, and then World Cup. I want to start this by, obviously, this is culminating in a, what do you think is going to happen in the series? Mm. But I think we're we're on the kind of World Cup countdown now, right? What's a good World Cup at this point for Shrunk? Is it a win? Final? Semi-final? Kind of... Semi final, if Sri Lanka make it to the semi final, it would be. I know they've never done it before, so obviously it'll be their best achievement. But to do it in a group with Australia and India would be just unbelievable. It'll be a huge, huge upset if that happens. Uh, I've, like I said, I've, I'm still not sure whether we, we, can, we can kind of expect that because, like I mentioned before, Australia and India have been kind of ahead above everybody else in the last couple of I mean Australia has been good all the time but India have been really good over the last couple of years as well so it's going to be really tough I think they have to finish third in that group that would be for me given their form that would be a really good finish if they make it the semi-finals man they should get like a motorcade when they come back to Sri Lanka because like that would be incredible the two two top teams in the women's game right now if they can beat one of them and make it to the same, it'd be incredible. We're going to have a lot more on this, on Sri Lanka's road to the World Cup and then what happens at the World Cup when the, um, as and when things pop up here in the Marley End. So do stick with us, subscribe and follow whatever you need to do. Make sure you're along the journey for us. Estelle, looking kind of longer term, we need to get more girls playing franchise cricket, right? Because at the moment, Charmer is the only one. Um, but you look at our side and you're like, there's several girls now who, who really, they're going to continue to put good performances in for Sri Lanka, but to really push on and become really, truly world-class, they need to go play and be playing in other parts of the world on a regular basis and earning that kind of top dollar as well, right? How, how do we do that? Yeah, that's a tricky one because like the women's franchise landscape is very different from the men's one, right? You've got the WPL, but half the number of teams as the men's. You've got the CPL, which at the moment is kind of an exhibition type thing. I think fair break might be back next year or later this year. Uh, so you don't necessarily have a lot of options, right? Uh, WPL is going to be really, really tough because like I said, you know, half the number of teams as the IPL. Um, and you have a kind of pre- bias or prejudice towards players from Australia, England, South Africa, who, who get picked a lot in, in the WPL. Uh, so it's going to be tough. I think now would be a good time to start a Sri Lankan franchise tournament, even if it's even if it starts out as, as the WPL did in a, in a kind of a, you have four teams and have exhibition games or whatever. I think that's, that's still kind of a good, good place to start. Because like you said, right, a lot of, new a lot of players kind of putting their hands up right now uh showing that they are at that international level uh i mean any and if you look at if you look at this this squad right they've got another under 19 player coming in um rashmika rashmika sewandi who was really really impressive i should say in that tri series against england and australia she's a medium pace bowler can bat a bit as well then you've got sashini gimhani the ambidextrous wrist spinner right uh, who i'm told can also bat left and right handed which is i mean <laughs> incredible um uh, is it though because when you're talked to bat you're talked about your wrong hand anyway right sorry what's no i mean like you don't get that you don't get that 
a lot, right? Where you can do basically everything on the cricketing field with both hands. Yeah. But I mean, ambidextrous bowling is incredible. But yeah. when you talk to bat, you talk, you, you, you end up, orth the orthodox way of batting is But you your dominant the hand, hand is the bottom, is your proper hand, right? Yeah. yeah. No, it's so if you talk. Mark. Mark, it's impressive. It's impressive. Yeah, it is, it is really impressive. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I and just like, thought I'd throw if, something in if there. You, if you look at the squad, like I said, right? Like, Inokaranavir is not in this squad. I know. I can't. Can I just like, say, I can't believe that because she's been such a stalwart for so long. Like, two and years she's ago, so good. Oshadi Rana Singh and Inokaranavir are like the, two of the first names on that team sheet, right? Yeah. And not really anymore. And the, the interesting thing is, like, you have like 32, 33 plus players, and then you have players younger than 25 like Hashita is 25 and then you have like a five or six players who are under 25 like teenagers so that, yeah yeah so like there is certainly some depth coming through like um 60 players are contracted by SLC who get paid and get get to train at the high performance center and stuff right so um there is that depth so it, it it's I know a lot of people were calling for franchise tournament before but I think now is really a good time to start it because you could easily have three teams playing an exhibition tournament this year um who could who could be really competitive um i think that's that should be the first step in getting players into franchise cricket because like i mentioned like the the the, the landscape is very very tough to get into right now uh because there aren't that many competitive tournaments around so me and you've i've called for a, a women's lpl for almost from the first moment we started podcasting together. Um, and I kind of feel like it's a, I've, no one at SLC has ever talked to me about this. And I talked to them about the S the LPL a lot. Um, but I kind of feel like that's what they're kind of preparing and gearing themselves up for. Right. Cause we saw like the under 19s tri series earlier this, um, earlier this calendar year. And I kind of feel that maybe, do you remember for the WPL, for, for the kind of couple of years before that the BCCI said there wasn't enough players of quality mm -hmm. to play it. And obviously everyone disagreed with them and, and kind of rightfully so. But I kind of do feel actually in hindsight, if they'd set up a WLPL at the same time they'd set up an LPL, then set up the LPL, they probably, the quality wouldn't have been that great. Yeah. But actually yeah. now, now you, you'll start to see that there is a generation of, of of mm. young players coming through that you could could do something you sprinkle in some of the women's other women's talent from around the world yeah and you know if i was in charge and of i it, mean that would it, it would be very different i feel mark from the men's one because you know this this lack of opportunity in women's franchise cricket it's felt by a lot of countries right yeah so you could potentially draw in a lot of players like call really good like i mean first year of the lpl most of the overseas players were retired, right? Like you had, like, did you have, did we have Munaf Patel? Oh, I don't know. Yeah. We had yeah, we did. Patan, right? Yeah, um, yeah. Who had retired like years ago. Um, so like the, if they do like start a, a, a women's LPL, I think you could really draw some pretty decent names from the women's game because of that lack of opportunity. And I forgot to mention the WBBL as well, right? Like, WPL and WBBL are the two big tournaments, but they are accommodating like in the grand scheme of things, very few players in the international game. So I, I don't think necessarily you need to have like Elise Perry playing in the LPL. It would be great if she came, obviously, but I don't think you necessarily need to even have those players. You could have like mid-level players um, and still have like a successful tournament. Um. Go back to the WBBL. I'd love to see, you know, Charmory was such a success mm. at Sydney last year. I don't like, no, I don't understand. If, if I was at SLC, I'd be trying to call everyone I knew involved in the BBL and be like, can we have some sort of memorandum of understanding that you've got to take <laughs> four girls? Like four, you know, you, you can have, you, obviously I was like, they can pick, pick whoever they want. Um, but on the flip side of that as well, I mean, if I ran a team in Melbourne, like half my family live in Melbourne, um, and they just go mad for anything Sri Lankan and cricket, <laughs> right? If you if 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 Vishmi turned up 
playing for uh, or Kavisha turns up playing for uh, the Renegades or or, mm. or the uh, the Re- Rebels or the Stars or anyone, they'd absolutely love it. You'd sell, you know, at S- in Sydney Thunder, they ended up, you know, m- make you know, Charmery became a big marketing tool for them yeah. by the end of it, yeah. and that could easily happen to any one of these girls. You you, you pick an eighteen year old Vishmi and you go right, we're gonna we're gonna back you for the next five seasons. You know, by the time she's 22, 23, she's going to be absolutely scoring runs for you. Harsh through as mm. well. Um, and the, you can kind of ha- almost, if you know, there's a huge striker community all over, in almost every major city in Australia. I don't understand why in the Big Bash, where they, you know, they have to work hard to sell tickets. They aren't kind of harnessing this yeah. a, a, a bit and more. Also, and also, you no remember... For so long, they were the only women's franchise league. But now they've got, like, already in its second season, the WPL has left them in the dust, right? Uh, yeah. I'm not going to comment on the quality of cricket or comparison of the quality, but in terms of, like, as a product, the WPL has surpassed them already. So they are going to be looking for new kind of avenues to get more people interested. I don't think it'll happen because obviously nobody really takes Sri Lanka seriously as a market. Uh, but um, yeah, that, I mean, if you can get like two, three players involved in the WBBL, that would be huge. Yeah, be absolutely massive. Um, Estelle, what's your prediction for the T20 series with the West Indies then? It's a funny one because we did predictions in our show with Santoki and he was, he told us that, you know, T20 is West Indies strong uh, format. So it's going to be a whitewash. But seeing how they went, I don't know if Haley Matthews is fit and will play. Uh, without Haley Matthews, it, yeah, it's going to be a struggle, I think, for West Indies. So I still think it won't be as comfortable as it was in the ODIs. Uh, but probably 2-1 to Sri Lanka. I'm going to go with that as well because I'm the eternal and optimist. And if, if we can 2-1 with this bowling attack where you don't have... The experience of Ranavira, Prabodhini, or uh, Achinikula Surya, that'd be massive. Uh, before we, we finish off, I forgot we got a question from Sanjit who asked oh, about yeah. Test cricket. Why aren't the women playing more Test cricket? They played one Test. I should lay my cards on the table here and say I'm very keen to make a. a that Estelle's nodding her head. She doesn't want to like. She doesn't want to be involved in this. I want to make a documentary <laughs> about that one Test Sri Lanka oh, played yeah, against Pakistan. For sure. Yeah. We have a 100% um, win record, right? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm going I'm to say what I think about this. Yeah. And then you can tell me I'm all wrong. Essentially, I don't think w- people are even going to be bothering ans- asking this question in 10 years' time. I think test cricket financially only makes sense for three nations in the world. Maybe four, because I think Pakistan or oh, kind of half South Africa kind of figured out how to make it work for them financially as well. Test cricket loses a lot of money for SLC. I'm I love Test cricket, but the reality is is that it's not working as a system, and one nation, one small island, cannot fix it from our side. Um, so I kind of feel like actually we should just focus on playing white ball cricket i feel that for the men and the women um i'm not kind of denying women test cricket uh you could argue that you know if if men are going to play it then the women should play it but i kind of feel actually sri lanka cricket should be working to create as many top level women's cricketers as possible and that at this point in the way cricket works financially that red ball cricket is just a luxury item that realistically we shouldn't really be considering preparing or creating kind of red ball players uh, for in women's cricket because there's no future in it. And actually the future for it is in white ball cricket and our, our, all our guns should be focused on trying to create as many white ball cricketers as possible. Um, but Estelle, you can tell me I'm totally wrong and I'm thinking it as a purely capitalist pig perspective. No, I think I agree with you. I just think that what's the purpose, right? Apart from just getting a tick and these players have played test cricket, what is the purpose? And I'll go a step further. I think if test cricket isn't open or isn't um, a part of the ICC's calendar, it shouldn't be official for anyone. 
like how unfair is it that England and Australia, South Africa, India playing test cricket and like the other countries don't get to do that and it's like completely in the hands of the boards. I think it should be if they if they see test cricket as a as something they want to do in the women's side of things, then it should be governed by the ICC and fixtures set into place similar to uh, the the test championship, right? Because otherwise, like because there there aren't structures in place. No, how many countries? I think England are playing a multi-day tournament this year, but apart from that, how many have like? a red ball tournament so what are you really trying to achieve through it apart from it being like a you know for a player it's obviously a massive thing right to play a test game and you know I always look back at one like probably my favorite cricketer Susie Bates right never played a test and that's always going to be like a thing on her record right you know great player never played a test Um, if it's not accessible to everyone who is a test nation then what is the point of it like i understand okay they played as like they have the one-off test for the ashes um but other than that like what are we trying to achieve like you said if if you're looking at it from a market perspective probably again india australia england are, are probably going to be able to market it as like a proper product and you know get people involved i know in Probably in England, people pay more attention to like the Test summer than they do to limit overs cricket, right? So maybe that is an option, but it just it just feels unfair. I think this will be a really unpopular <laughs> opinion among people. Uh, but I just feel like what's the point, right? Because you're you're investing re- if you're investing resources, there should be a purpose to it, right? Like there isn't at the moment, and already the resources are limited why not direct that towards making sri lanka the best white ball team you can yeah i absolutely 100 percent agree I, I just there's no kind of out in red bull cricket for from there's barely a, there's kind of a bit of kudos in it with the men's game but there's there's kind of nothing for that in the in the women's game and, and i'd even considered that you know they're not even playing it domestically right can yeah. you imagine like how how would you uh, apropos of nothing you basically throw together if they did Sri Lanka versus Pakistan again? Mm. I mean, none of those women have played more than fifty over cricket, right? Yeah. So suddenly they're just what you're going to expect them to play four days. Mm. Um, a te- like it's it's not going to work. They're they're yeah, going to end up playing like, two again. two fifty over games, right? Like yeah, yeah, and at the end of the day, if like say it's a regular fixture, like every series you play. Uh, a test one test each or whatever right like is it worth it at like is it worth putting an effort into that when it might take away from your skills as a limited overs cricketer i know like if you look at the men's side of things countries like sri lanka are struggling because they have a lot of three format players right and it's no longer easy to go from t20 to test um and like when you've grown up with i think Again, I'm going off topic, but like, if you look at Afghanistan's rise, right? They've been T20 focused or limited overs focused right from the start. That's why, like, they they don't have that emotional baggage of technique and stuff as much as other countries that you're you're born and raised in, like, play proper cricket because Test cricket is the pinnacle, right? So, if anything's gonna risk how you play limited overs cricket, I think it's not worth it. I just think at this point it's not it shouldn't it shouldn't be a priority for even SLC. Agreed. Um Estelle, should we leave it there? We'll be back um probably at the back after the T twenty series is over to discuss what pick the bones out of that. Um as I say, if you haven't already hit the subscribe button, follow us. Um, we are the Morally End and we exist to talk about shrunken cricket. We've also got a newsletter, so to write about shrunken cricket as well. Uh, give us a follow, tell all your friends. We'll be back with you guys very soon. <laughs>